Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And today we're going to discuss what kind of president do you actually want? What kind of leader works best for America? Because one of our options is that fellow on the upper left, Calvin Coolidge, the caretaker. And we're going to examine the presidency of Calvin Coolidge in some detail. And along the way, we're going to meet Model T's and flapper girls, jazz and liquor, gangsters. We're going to visit Satan's playground. We're going to watch an American president become an Indian chief and talk about how a farming crisis becomes a banking crisis, which becomes a profound economic crisis. And we're going to do so following that outline right up above my head. So put that in your notes to serve as a framework for the information that's about to follow as we build an answer to that question on the lower left. Wilson versus Coolidge, or what kind of America do you want? Evaluate the presidencies of Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge, their respective ideologies, their successes, and their failures in the early 20th century. From a modern perspective, who was the better president? Now, Woodrow Wilson's political career ends quite sadly. He has a massive stroke in October of 1919, and he is effectively paralyzed for the last 17 months of his presidency, paving the way for a massive massive Republican victory in the election of 1920. Warren Harding coasts into the presidency on a wave of support, and it, Warren Harding is elected specifically to undo the activist presidency of Woodrow Wilson. Warren Harding wins 60% of the popular vote. It's a massive win. Now, Warren Harding, as a senator, had actually led the fight against Woodrow Wilson's European plans and against the League of Nations in the Senate. Warren Harding ran on a return to normalcy. He wanted to move away from Wilson's radical reimagining of the American government. He wanted to move away from foreign entanglements in Europe. Now, Warren Harding has his own set of scandals. He gets involved in this bribery scandal with the Teapot Dome. He gets involved in this sexual scandal with his 24-year-old secretary. And he manages to avoid all of these scandals by dying. He dies on August 2nd, 1923, and his vice president becomes the president of the United States. And that man was Calvin Coolidge. That's him on the lower left. Calvin Coolidge is actually visiting his father in Vermont at the time when they receive this news that, you know, you have to be sworn in as president. So they look around like, who is the nearest judge? And much to their surprise, Calvin Coolidge's father is the nearest judge. So Calvin Coolidge becomes the only president sworn in as president by his own father. And this is the beginning of the presidency of Calvin Coolidge, which lasts from 1923 all the way to 1929. So let's stop and just talk. Who is this guy? Who is Calvin Coolidge? Now, he's a New Englander. He's born in Vermont on July 4th. 1872. He was a successful lawyer in Boston who rose through the ranks of the Republican Party to eventually become the governor of Massachusetts in 1918. And he became uh, famous nationally as a result of his actions during this massive police Boston strike of 1919. We're going to examine that in just a bit because what happens in 1919 is that as a response to low wages and long hours and wartime inflation, the Boston Police Department was very upset and the policemen voted to strike. And the result was the 1919 Boston police strike. The police go on strike and Boston explodes into violence. Street gangs break into stores, looting is rampant. The striking police start fighting openly in the streets because the mayor of Boston brings in the state police and the city police are fighting with the state police the entire city dissolves into chaos. Nine people are killed, but the strike was massively unpopular. People blamed the striking policemen for the violence and the chaos in the streets of Boston. And in fact, this strike is one of the very few strikes uh, in American history where the people, the average workers, refused to side with the strikers. They sided with the government against the strikers. The mayor of Boston admits it has escaped his control, and the people of Boston appeal to the governor for help. Governor Coolidge then calls out the Massachusetts State Guard, and he asks for veterans returning from World War I to volunteer for the job. Calvin Coolidge lays out his terms very clearly. There is no right to strike against the public safety, 
by anyone, anywhere, at any time. And the World War I veterans rallied to the governor. Governor Coolidge seized control of the Boston Police Department. He got a list of the Boston police and he fired 90% of them. He instantly fired 1,500 police officers in one day. And then over the next few years, they rebuilt the Boston police force pretty much from the ground up, allowing veterans and the state guard to patrol the streets of Boston for several years. And it worked. The chaos ended and his actions were incredibly popular. Overnight, Calvin Coolidge became a national hero. And this is why Warren Harding picks Law and Order Coolidge to, as his running mate in 1920. In an America uh, racked with the Spanish flu, the results of the Great War, police strikes, there's an economic depression, the Palmer raids are still going on, Wilson's wartime socialism is still everywhere. The American people had had enough. They wanted Warren Harding's return to normalcy. They wanted law and order Coolidge. Now, Coolidge was a very taciturn individual, and it earns him this lifelong nickname, Silent Cow. But he was highly intelligent. He was highly skilled. Uh, he was fluent in multiple uh, languages. In fact, one diplomat jokingly described him as, you know, the president can be silent in five languages. And this makes his political philosophy less than transparent, less than apparent. Unlike Wilson, who wrote everything down, uh, Coolidge wrote virtually nothing at all. So the philosopher of this caretaker president has to kind of be pieced together from his actions and speeches uh, given throughout his life. Many of these speeches and addresses were later collected into Coolidge's book on political philosophy, titled Have Faith in Massachusetts, published 1919 a year before the big Republican landslide of 1920. And later, Calvin Coolidge becomes one of the first American presidents to give regular radio addresses, often speaking directly to the American people through this strange new medium of radio. And this is Calvin Coolidge's opinion on laws and governance as he describes in Have Faith in Massachusetts. Coolidge writes, Men do not make laws, they do but discover them. Laws must be justified by something more than the will of the majority. They must rest on the eternal foundation of righteousness. That state is most fortunate in its form of government, which has the aptest instruments for the discovery of laws. Again, people don't create laws. They don't invent laws. They merely discover the laws that work really well. This is a caretaker philosophy. Good laws and good governance are things slowly discovered over time, not invented wholesale. A caretaker government sees itself as the inheritor of a system that already works pretty well. And if a problem arises, then the problem can be identified and addressed through federal action. But it is the role of the government, it is the role of the president, to simply be a caretaker, a gardener to do as little as possible and save their strength for the really big problems that it simply cannot avoid. And this is another one of Calvin Coolidge's sayings. It is much more important to kill bad bills than it is to pass good ones. Calvin Coolidge would be completely happy vetoing a hundred bad laws rather than passing one really good one. And Calvin Coolidge adores the Constitution. To him, it is a sacred document discovered by the Founding Fathers. In fact, this is what Calvin Coolidge says about the U.S. Constitution. To live under the American Constitution is the greatest political privilege that was ever accorded to the human race. And again, compare and contrast Coolidge's perspective on the American Constitution, which it is this near-perfect document discovered by the Founding Fathers, to Woodrow Wilson's opinion of the U.S. Constitution, in that it is an impediment to progress and the will of the government to impose uh, its goals and to find the goals of society. And it's a really interesting question to ask, like how each man's view of the U.S. Constitution reflects their respective views uh, for the role of government in society. It's really interesting. Uh, Calvin Coolidge reveres and would never dream of changing a single period or comma in the U.S. Constitution, but to Woodrow Wilson, it's just something to be ignored or discarded or altered at will.
So, in 1923, Silent Cal becomes president, and he inherits a country that is absolutely tired of Wilson's activism. And of course, the first really big issue is a brutal economic recession that has been caused by the end of the Great War. Now, Coolidge had a great advantage in this, in that he inherited Warren Harding's Secretary of the Treasury, a fellow named Andrew Mellon. That's Andrew Mellon right up above my head. And Andrew Mellon is a treasure. Andrew Mellon was an economic genius, probably the most brilliant American treasurer since the days of Alexander Hamilton. Now, Andrew Mellon was actually an old robber baron left over from the Gilded Age. He was a banker. He was like a really good friend of Henry Frick, if, if you can remember him. Uh, Andrew Mellon and, and Henry Frick would like tour Europe buying art together. And one of the things that both Coolidge and Mellon really, really hated was the concept of federal income taxes. They don't like this at all. In fact, they view it as something that was profoundly mistaken. And this is what Coolidge says on the subject. The collection of taxes, which are not absolutely required, which do not beyond reasonable doubt contribute to public welfare, is only a species of legalized larceny. Under this republic, the rewards of industry belong to those who earn them. Coolidge and Mellon do not like the federal income tax system, which, have, which has, after all, it's only 10 years old. Now, they don't have the power to abolish the income system, but they can weaken the system. What they do is together, Coolidge and Mellon devise a series of massive cuts in income taxes. They cut taxes by more than two thirds, from 71% taxes at the highest tax bracket to less than 25%. This becomes the lowest federal income tax in American history. Now, this is the origin of what will eventually be called supply-side economics. You can see up there in all caps. Supply-side economics is the idea that cutting taxes increases economic activity as the government is not pulling money out of the economy through income tax. And as people get to keep their own money, they then spend it on themselves or they spend it on their homes or they spend it on improvements in their lives. And the result is economic growth. Hence, supply-side economic increases it actually increases the supply of goods and services. That's why it's called supply side. Less government action increases economic prosperity, or at least that's how it's supposed to work in theory. And this is what Coolidge says on the subject. I want the people of America to be able to work less for the government and more for themselves. I want them to have the rewards of their own industry. This is the chief meaning of freedom. Calvin Coolidge is going to shrink the federal government. And it worked. The supply side economics works. The cut in federal income taxes works. The sharp recession of 1919 to 1923 vanishes almost overnight. And it leads to six years of large scale, massive economic growth, a period of growth that will become known as the Roaring Twenties. This was a period of economic growth, the scale of which had not been seen since the Gilded Age. The entire U.S. economy increases by almost 30% in a six-year period. Yet this is a very different kind of economic growth from what happened back in the Gilded Age. The Roaring Twenties didn't have the downsides of the Gilded Age. Instead, this economic growth was accompanied by a surge in consumer spending, vibrant art and music, and an optimistic modernist spirit. This was a deep prosperity that reached all levels of the American social structure. This was prosperity far in excess of anything, anything seen during the days of Woodrow Wilson. And suddenly, your average American is now able to afford things which before the 20s were, you know, the mechanical playthings and toys of the ultra-rich. Suddenly, almost everyone can afford a Model T car. You can buy one back in 1924 for $250. Incredible. People, ordinary Americans can now buy beautiful clothes and the latest fashions. They can buy such incredible electric gigaws as a refrigerator. This is a level of prosperity that reaches deep down into the American class structure. Suddenly, working class families have refrigerators, cars, beautiful clothing. This is, this is the Roaring Twenties. And Calvin Coolidge slashes the government left over from Woodrow Wilson. He cuts it by more than a quarter, fires 25% of all federal employees. The economic boom from the Roaring Twenties resulted in more tax revenue being collected. 
thus allowing C Calvin Coolidge to cut the U.S. federal debt by half. Calvin Coolidge ends up being the most fiscally responsible president since Andrew Jackson. Calvin Coolidge pays off many of Woodrow Wilson's debts. He pays off debts left from World War I. He pays off the debts left over from the implementation of the new freedom. Calvin Coolidge sits on top of this massive surge in economic growth caused by Andrew Mellon and the slashing uh, of the federal income tax. And this is this very famous quote by Calvin Coolidge. The chief business of the American people is business. If government kept its hands off the economy, business would prosper. Is he correct, though? Is Calvin Coolidge correct? Is the business of the American people business? At any rate, Calvin Coolidge is incredibly popular, especially for a man who doesn't like to talk. And it comes to 1924, he is overwhelmingly reelected in the election of 1924. He doesn't quite get the crazy numbers Warren Harding got back in 1920, but winning 54% of the popular vote is nothing to sneeze at. Calvin Coolidge can't even smile in his own reelection, in his own reelection stickers. He won't do it. And this is the Roaring Twenties. There are flapper girls. This is the Harlem Renaissance. Jazz, you got people dancing the Charleston, talking about Sigmund Freud. Everybody's hanging out in speakeasies. There's this birth of American literature, art, and letters. This is the period of the lost generation, these kind of jaded veterans coming back from World War I, thinking that they were promised, they were fighting for civilization and democracy, and only to find they were largely fighting to save the bottom line of New York banks. So the lost generation writers are really cynical. They're these, these really deeply pessimistic authors like Ernest Hemingway or William Faulkner, Langston Hughes, and of course, the most famous novel of the, of the era. In fact, arguably the most famous novel of, of all time, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. And many people have described The Great Gatsby as the perfect American novel. But art and literature get very, very cynical. They get very, very pessimistic in this period of the lost generation. But Hollywood movies go in the opposite direction. Hollywood movies move away from Birth of a Nation. They move into comedy. And America welcomes one of this great comedic genius in Charlie Chaplin. All of these movies become an escape from nature, become an escape from reality. Anybody can go walk into a kinetoscope or pay their two bits and walk into a movie theater and sit and watch Charlie Chaplin amuse them for an hour. It becomes incredibly popular. Now, before I'd mentioned people hanging out in speakeasies. So, like, what exactly is a speakeasy? This is still the era of prohibition. And speakeasies are actually hidden bars. They're secret bars in cellars or underneath warehouses or at the very tops of hotels. And you can see the people in the speakeasy on the lower left making fun of the 18th Amendment, drinking to the 18th Amendment. These are secret bars. But the problem with many of these secret bars, many of these speakeasies, is that they're all run by gangsters. All right? But of course, all the bootlegging and smuggling and all the speakeasies, these are all illegal. And they're all being run by organized crime, largely the Italian mafia. And in the 1920s, prohibition fueled the rapid rise of organized crime. The crime rate skyrocketed, the murder rate doubled, and the prison population exploded as these organizations of criminals began to engage in larger and larger criminal wars over control of the illegal alcohol trade. But other factors also contributed to the economic prosperity of the Roaring Twenties. And one of these things was the devastation that had been inflicted on Europe during World War I. I mean, World War I just devastated Europe. Many of the European nations like France, Britain, and Germany, they had been economic competitors to the United States before the war, but now they began to rely very heavily on imports from the United States as they struggled to rebuild their countries. And the second thing that really contributed to the uh, roaring 20s was the massive war debt owed to the United States. Again, France and Britain alone owed the United States more than 10 billion dollars. And they really struggled to make payments. You can see on that chart on the left, the, the debt owed by these foreign countries to the United States. Britain is 
barely able to make the interest payments on its loans. But that massive flow of cash from Europe into the United States helps to fuel the American economy. And it's, and it's worthwhile to stop and kind of talk about what's happening in Europe after the end of World War I. Germany loses World War I. Their nation shatters at the end of 1918, and they are forced to sign a humiliating Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Germany itself is broken up. Uh, you know, huge areas are carved away from Imperial Germany. And without American mediation, because the Americans completely rejected Wilson's peace treaty, the Allied powers impose a brutal, brutal treaty on the defeated Germans. And it becomes known as the Treaty of Versailles of 1919. And the Treaty of Versailles has four major points to it. It calls for Germany, one, to accept guilt from the war. Two, Germany has to pay massive war reparations to the Allied nations around the realm of $31 billion. Three, Germany has to surrender a quarter of their entire nation. And five, Germany has to, has to accept very heavy military restrictions on the size of their army and navy. And the problem with the Treaty of Versailles, the problem with the Treaty of Versailles is that it's brutal enough to humiliate a proud and industrious nation, but it's not crippling enough to really ever slow them down. In other words, the Treaty of Versailles really does nothing more than really, really anger and humiliate the German people. And it's only a matter of time before the German people demand uh, retribution for this defeat and humiliation. And it is for this reason that the leader of the Allied armies, uh, Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch, says, this is not peace. He looks at the Treaty of Versailles and says, this is not peace. This is an armistice for 20 years. He will be absolutely correct. And after the Treaty of Versailles, you have this period in Germany called Weimar Germany. And it's called Weimar Germany because the Constitution was written in Weimar. And Weimar Germany can barely can really control the country. And it's this period of a great deal of economic instability and political instability as Germany is just kind of trying to put itself together you know, from the ruin of the First World War. And Germany particularly suffered. Uh, it experienced a near total economic collapse in the early 1920s. And in a desperate attempt to save their country, Weimar Germany resorted to something called hyperinflation. They began to simply print money outrageously in an attempt to pay all their bills and keep the country solvent. And the result of hyperinflation was a complete and total disaster. I mean, you can see the guy in the street literally sweeping up German money because it's so utterly worthless that people just leave it in the gutter. There's a loaf of bread which is being sold for 460,000 Deutschmarks. That is hyperinflation. This affected the United States because Weimar Germany is trying to pay its war reparations to France and Britain, and France and Britain are trying to use those war reparations to pay off their debt to the United States. So if Germany actually collapses, so does France and Britain. And if France and Britain collapse, then they're going to bring down the American banking system. So hyperinflation becomes a, starts as a German problem and rapidly becomes an international problem. And you can see there's the, the dollar bill right at the top, that, that currency, a hundred billion mark. There is a toilet paper and the amount of money required to buy uh, the, that roll of toilet paper. This is hyperinflation. Now, Weimar Germany isn't alone. Other countries have experienced a hyperinflation. And there's this great little chart there on the upper left, like what causes hyperinflation. And it happens when a country begins to print money to pay for goods and services. Uh, but because it's printing money, the value of the money drops and inflation goes up. And instead of trying to rein in its spending, the government then just proceeds to print more money and gets trapped in this cycle of having to print money, to spend the money, but in printing the money, they drive prices up, which means they have to print more money. And the result is these economies which absolutely collapse under the weight of hyperinflation. That picture on the bottom left is from Venezuela. Venezuela went through its own cycle of hyperinflation in the 21st century, and there is six tomatoes, and the stacks of cash is how much money required to buy those six tomatoes. Uh, in Africa, Zimbabwe went through hyperinflation, and there is a day laborer, and in the wheelbarrow 
it, that's how much, that's his daily pay. The money becomes absolutely worthless uh, in a cycle of hyperinflation. But you see, hyperinflation was a German problem that then became an international problem. So Calvin Coolidge asks his vice president, a guy called Charles Dawes, to remedy the situation. And this is what Charles Dawes comes up with. The Dawes Plan of 1923. The Dawes Plan was an arrangement between the United States and Weimar Germany in which the Germans could make use of the American banking system. They could borrow money from American banks to, to invest money in their own country and thus spark economic growth. Their growing economy would then pay off their war reparations to France and Britain, and that would enable France and Britain to pay their debt to the United States. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a very complex uh, situation. So the U.S. invests in Germany. The German economy grows. They pay their war reparations to France and Britain, and then France and Britain pay off their debt to the United States. Right, that's how it's supposed to work. And it did work. It, it sort of worked. And, you know, you, you can see from the cartoon on the upper left, the, that's a German cartoon. They were very, very happy that the Americans showed up to save their economy. The Dawes Plan and its successor, something called the Young Plan, actually worked. It stabilized the German economy. It got rid of this hyperinflation. But, there's a big but here. You can see it. It's right there. But, this firmly anchored the German economy to the American banking system. So the entire German economy and therefore the entire German political structure become dependent on the stability of American banks. If Weimar Germany wanted any kind of monetary liquidity, it was dependent on American banks and it is dependent on the American stock market. This is Calvin Coolidge as the caretaker president. He's just a gardener taking care of a garden that somebody else planned. And this is the Dawes plan. A problem emerges inside this garden and it is addressed in the most light-handed manner possible. Income taxes are a problem. Therefore, Calvin Coolidge doesn't uproot and rip out the income taxes. He just cuts it down to an absolute minimum. And thus he creates the booming economy of the Roaring Twenties. The economy of Weimar Germany has become a huge problem. He just trims it back, forms the Dawes plan to remedy the problem, and then Germany became a little more stable. He's a caretaker. He's just a gardener taking care of a garden that somebody else planned and planted. But there are two problems with this kind of light-handed approach. One, it assumes that there are no big pre-existing problems in America. The assumption of a caretaker government is that the garden kind of works as is that the nation doesn't need deep, deep reform anywhere. The caretaker is just going to address problems as they arise. Secondly, it is unable to anticipate or predict huge growing problems that will lead to a massive crisis and even catastrophe in the future because it's not a farsighted plan. A caretaker government is just going to take care of problems as they arise. For example, prohibition. Even by 1924, it was obvious that the 18th Amendment was a complete and total failure. It was felt very unevenly on the American people, with rich and affluent Americans having very little difficulty getting liquor, speakeasies abounded, whiskey stills proliferated. It's not hard to make whiskey. People brewed up gin in their bathtubs, bootleggers in speedboats, and fast cars would smuggle whiskey in from Canada and Mexico. Even empowered by the Volstead Act, which gave them the, the legal authority to enforce the 18th Amendment, Treasury agents were absolutely, hopelessly overwhelmed in trying to enforce uh, prohibition. And especially for people in Texas, if you wanted a drink, if you wanted a stiff glass of whiskey or a beer, you could just drive across the border. Mexico had no prohibition. And this is the origin of the party towns of the Mexican border. They all pop up during Prohibition, and it becomes a regular thing to get in your new Model T, drive to the border, and then walk across into Mexico to Viejo, Kentucky, Casa de Barril, Vinos, Whiskey, Tequila, Cerveza. These huge party towns just on the other side of the border. And some of these huge party towns get really, really infamous. Tijuana itself emerges as the border party town of Mexico. 
So much so that Tijuana acquires a nickname, Satan's Playground, because it's where all the movie stars would go to party to get around Prohibition. Prohibition was a profound failure. All it really did was give Americans a taste for hard liquor, usually served with mixers, which is to say the cocktail, because, and it was served with mixers because generally the gin and the whiskey was like awful because it had been brewed up in somebody's bathtub. And so they, they mixed these various mixers uh, with the hard liquor to hide the awful taste of the homebrewed gin or the homebrewed whiskey. And this, in fact, continues to this day. Uh, Americans generally prefer drinking highballs and boiler makers, fancy cocktails, instead of Europe, which just drinks generally beer, wine, and hard cider. But in America, we like our cocktails. In fact, we like our cocktails so much, we actually created a special soda to drink with backwoods moonshine. And that is the origin of Mountain Dew. Because the backwoods moonshine was so horrible tasting, they wanted to mix it with a very syrupy, super sweet, sugary soda. So they would mix the moonshine and the soda and the special soda that they made to mix with this moonshine was Mountain Dew. And that, that, is, that is actually the origin of the soda. Made to be drunk with backwoods moonshine. And prohibition gangsters rapidly grew in wealth and power. And these, these criminal organizations became elaborate organizations dedicated solely to defeating prohibition, de dedicated solely to defeating crime. There is the Mafia Commission. And you can see all of these famous gangsters over to the left. There's Al Capone, the original Scarface. There's Joe Bonanno. And one guy I want you to pay attention to, Lucky Luciano, one of the crime bosses of New York City. He gets very important later on. And all of this criminal organization is fueled by bootlegging. But from bootlegging, they expanded to gambling, prostitution, graft, fraud, theft, kidnapping, arson, bribery. They corrupt entire cities. They take over entire neighborhoods. And soon they begin to run large parts of the United States, most famously Chicago. There is the very infamous gangster Al Scarface Capone. He became the mob boss of Chicago, bribing judges, paying off the mayor, controlling the police. The organized crime families begin to escalate and they begin to go to war with each other. They're not worried about the police who can't even keep up with them. The real threat to these gangsters are other gangsters. And these other gangsters go to war with each other in crime wars of ever escalating violence. This is why the murder rate doubles, all right? People began to getting gunned down in the streets, shot at with Tommy guns. You can see from the crime statistics on the upper left, suicides, homicides, all of this is going up. And in the middle of this, most famously, is when Al Capone wipes out the last of his opposition in Chicago in the very infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where his gangsters, dressed up as Chicago police officers, rounded up you know, his rivals and gunned them down you know, against a warehouse wall. And some of the assassins might have actually been broad Chicago policemen. St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And in the face of all of this, Coolidge did nothing. It's not his problem. Now, while Calvin Coolidge did not support prohibition, it's not his role to rip it up. It, he did not see it as his job to try and change it by altering the Constitution. After all, he's just a caretaker. In fact, what he does is actually strip federal support for prohibition. Uh, he says, look, prohibition is largely an enforcement issue and it's best left up to local law enforcement. I'm not gonna send any federal police after them. And basically the completely underfunded and overpowered local police were no match for the gangsters. Calvin Coolidge did nothing, it wasn't his job. And then of course there is the sad and deteriorating situation in terms of civil rights, because Woodrow Wilson's old dream of expanding Jim Crow across the United States begins to actually happen. And you can see in this map on the lower left, Jim Crow begins to spread out from the Old South, and it begins to take over states that were never part of the old Confederacy. West Virginia, Delaware, Missouri, Oklahoma, even it starts cropping up in places that used to be quite opposed uh, that used to be quite opposed to slavery, that were in favor of, of, of racial equality, like Kansas. 
Wyoming. These were places which were never part of the Old South, and they suddenly start passing these laws, greatly restricting the civil rights of African Americans. And during this period, membership in the Ku Klux Klan surges, largely as a result of the popularity of the film Birth of a Nation. The Ku Klux Klan in this period reached the height of its membership, peaking with 4 million members in 1924. There they are, marching in Washington, D.C. They don't even bother covering their face anymore. They were an openly racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic group that used torture and death to support Jim Crow laws and to help spread Jim Crow across the nation. In fact, the presence of the Ku Klux Klan at the 1924 Democratic National Convention is so strong that the Klan actually makes an attempt to take over the entire Democratic Party. And the Klan tries to take over the Democratic Party. Some of the Democrats fight back. Uh, there's a measure made to condemn the Klan, which fails on a party-wide vote. And in fact, at the 1924 Democratic National Convention, so many Democrats are also members of the KKK that the Ku Klux Klan holds its national convention at the same time. And there's buses so that the Democrats can go to the Klan convention and that the Klan convention, the, the Klansmen can go and be part of the Democratic uh, National Convention. It's horrifying. Uh, and in fact, one of the few presidential candidates, one of the few you know, Democrats of any stature, that's him right there, who to fight against the Klan takeover of the Democratic Party is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Woodrow Wilson's old secretary of the Navy and the vice presidential candidate uh, back from 1920. And indeed, the 1920s was in fact the height of racism in America. It's as bad as it gets in the 1920s. And it gets bad. It gets really bad. Thousands of African Americans are lynched or otherwise murdered across the South, across the West, in these states that never were part of the Confederacy. Nobody ever knows the actual number of Americans that get murdered uh, in this period. And in fact, the 1920s experienced the worst incident of racial violence in American history, something called the Tulsa Massacre. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Fights break out between black Americans and white Americans. It escalates into street battles, which escalates into gunfighting. They set fire to the black part of town and even take crop dusting airplanes to drop sticks of dynamite and bomb bombs on the black part of town. They literally burn down the African-American part of town and destroy one of the most prosperous African-American communities in the United States. This is the worst incident of racial violence in American history. The Republicans actually start doing something. Northern Republicans eventually remember that they are, in fact, the party of Abraham Lincoln, and they try to halt this violence, even before Calvin Coolidge is president. They try to halt it, uh, led by this uh, Republican senator, Leonidas Dyer. Leonidas Dyer proposes the Dyer anti-lynching law of 1918. It, it sought to make racial lynch, lynching a federal crime, enforceable by federal police and subject to federal courts instead of local courts. That way, if so poor guy gets lynched in Louisiana or Mississippi, he's going to be tried in a federal court, you know, in the North and not a local court with a, like a bunch of racists in Alabama. Southern Democrats kill the bill, but Leonidas Dwyer will not stop. He sees it as his duty to attempt to defend the civil rights of African Americans. And year after year after year, Dyer reproposes his anti lynching law, reproposes his anti lynching law. And one of the things he wants to do is he wants to force Southern Democrats to attack and defend this horrible system of Jim Crow. And Leonidas Dwyer wants to show it for the ugly violence that it is. And Leonidas Dwyer calls upon President Coolidge for help. And Calvin Coolidge does nothing. While Calvin Coolidge supported the bill and spoke out in favor of the bill, he takes no direct action himself. And it's not that he had no sympathy. It's just that his ideology left no room for him to intervene. Calvin Coolidge viewed his role as a caretaker, merely preserving what pre-exists for a nearly perfect nation. This blinded Calvin Coolidge to the fact that like, America had deep, deep problems, especially deep problems relating to its treatment of African-Americans. 
And these problems needed large-scale reform. They needed long-term reform. Without President Coolidge's help, the dire anti-lynching bill is again, it, again, it fails to pass. And Congress has, in fact, never passed an anti-lynching bill, even up to the 21st century. They tried to pass one, I believe, in 2020, and again, it failed. Leonidas Dwyer's legacy still remains unfulfilled. But one of the odder things that Calvin Coolidge does is he really goes to bat not for African Americans, but for Native Americans, supporting the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, which automatically grants American citizenship to all Native Americans. And for his efforts, he's asked to visit the Sioux Indian Nation, and Calvin Coolidge is proclaimed to be a chief of the Sioux Nation. And that is how an American president became a Native American chief. Now, remember when I said there's two problems with Calvin Coolidge's ideology? There's two problems with this kind of caretaker approach to government? We've already talked to one, that there are no big pre-existing problems in America. But it's the second one that is going to be even more dire. It is a caretaker approach to government is unable to anticipate or predict growing problems that will eventually lead to a big crisis and even catastrophe. Because the United States is nearing an economic precipice. And something strange starts to go on with the economy. And it starts in the early 1920s with a farming crisis. So you have all these small farming towns scattered all across the country. Now, during the Great War, during World War I, the banks and the government had encouraged farmers to borrow a lot of money and greatly encouraged expansion. Farms across the country, even small farms, accumulated a lot of debt. They would borrow a lot of money to buy fertilizers and tractors and seed and expand their farms, thinking that they're just going to sell all of this food to Europe. And they did, uh, they did make a lot of money, but as they made more money, that just encouraged them to borrow more and more money. And you can see the price of corn and wheat uh, over there on the left. It goes up, it goes up, it goes up, and then it comes crashing down. Because as European agriculture recovered from World War I, the nations of Europe not only stopped buying American food, but the nations of Europe began to sell their own agricultural produce. And they, the, the nations of Europe went from customers to competitors. Prices collapsed. Look at that. The price of corn fell by 63% in 1920, 1921. Uh, the price of wheat falls by 52%. Farming incomes collapsed by two-thirds, but so many of these small farms owed a lot of money to their local banks. And this is how a farming crisis eventually starts to become a banking crisis. As small-town banks start foreclosing on family farms, and you can see in the chart right up above me, that's the rate of farm mortgage foreclosures. And you can see it just goes up and up and up. It becomes very, very difficult to make a living as a small farmer in the 1920s. And when banks foreclose on these farms, they seize these farms, but then nobody wants to buy these farms because, again, it's really hard to make a living as a small farmer. So the result is, is that all of these small banks just get saddled with worthless farm after worthless farm, and these banks themselves start to fail. Between 1920 and 1929, more than 200 rural banks go out of business. And because banks at the time were not required to carry insurance, when a bank collapses, it takes the life uh, savings of every one of its customers with it. And if you've got a small town with only one bank, that bank goes belly up. It will wipe out the savings of your town. It might even wipe out the entire town. Whole small towns are erased as this wave of bank failure just crosses the United States. But you see, all of these little banks are connected. Little banks are connected to each other, and little banks are connected to the big banks. You can see in the chart right there, all of these banks are constantly lending money to one another. They're moving currency back and forth. So as this wave of bank failures in the countryside begins to affect the big banks in the big cities, all of that debt that had been accumulated by the little banks moves into the big banks. And these banks start carrying a lot of debt. People begin to not trust the banking system because so many banks are going out of business. People started to react in one of two ways. The first was to just kind of quietly pull your money out of the bank 
and put it in a box and bury it in the backyard or slip it under your mattress to just pull your money out of the economy altogether. Or two, stick your money in one place that can't go out of business, a place that seems very, very safe, especially given the booming economy of the 1920s, you know, as long as you weren't a farmer. And that safe place was the stock market, specifically the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, the stock market was seen as being much, much safer with banks. And it was so much safer than banks that even the banks themselves, now that they're carrying all of this accumulated debt, see investment in the stock market as a way to discharge that debt that they have accumulated by taking over these little banks. So this whole time, all of this money starts to flow into the stock market. People began to pour money into the stock market because the stock market can't go out of business. And look, it goes up and up and up. It's just a great rate of return. But as, as this money is going into the stock market, the amount of money in circulation is slowly declining because some people are literally just sticking money under their mattress. Le liquidity, which is the degree of flexibility in any economic system, was declining. So in other words, the stock market was booming, but at the same time, it was becoming much much more brittle, and everyone's life savings were now depending on the prosperity of the New York Stock Exchange. In short, by the end of the 1920s, the entire American economy was slowly turning into a ticking time bomb. But nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw that coming. Calvin Coolidge certainly didn't see that coming. Indeed, Coolidge vetoes several farm bills aimed at farm relief, thinking that agriculture just needs to work its own problems out. The idea that the farming crisis could eventually result in, in, in total economic catastrophe was just inconceivable. And also around the same time, Calvin Coolidge is distracted by a great personal tragedy. His youngest son, the boy he's wrapping in the flag in the photograph right up above me, he develops an infection on his foot. The infection goes from bad to worse. It goes septic. Uh, and with stunning speed, the kid dies of six, he's 16 years old. He dies of an infection. And Calvin Coolidge never really recovers from this really terrible uh, personal tragedy. He never really, really recovers from the death of his youngest son. And he goes from this really engaged, intelligent, you know, leader to this like man who's morose. He's exhausted. He sleeps upwards of 12 hours a day. He's People get him, it's really hard to get him focused on a task. And as 1929 draws near, Republicans were like, the economy is great, Calvin Coolidge. Everybody loves you. You should absolutely run for a third term, Calvin Coolidge. But Calvin Coolidge is done. Calvin Coolidge is absolutely done. He, he's just incredibly depressed over the death of his son. And while he is a very popular president, and he probably would have won re-election in 1928. He just doesn't want it. He just doesn't want it anymore. He gives 10 words that says he is not running for re-election because he is silent Cal after all. So he, he ends up backing his protege, his secretary of commerce, this really energetic uh, mining engineer called Herbert Hoover, all caps, Herbert Hoover. And on the strength of Calvin Coolidge's recommendation, Herbert Hoover is easily elected president in 1928. One of the really interesting things about the election of Herbert Hoover in 1928 is his vice president is Charles Curtis, who is actually Native American. He becomes the first person of color to actually get elected to high office inside the United States. Yeah, 1928. And Herbert Hoover is president. Everybody likes Herbert Hoover. Calvin Coolidge picked him out. Seven months into Herbert Hoover's uh, presidency, that ticking time bomb of the economy detonates. And that day is called Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929. The economy explodes. All of that money went into the New York Stock Exchange. And in two days, the New York Stock Exchange loses 23% of its value. By the year's end, the Stock Exchange has lost 50% of its value. Over the next three years, the Stock Exchange has lost 98% of its value. All of that money that's been poured into the stock exchange disappears. People are ruined. The economy is paralyzed. The Great Depression has begun.
and the Great Depression will be the greatest existential crisis in the United States since the days of the Civil War. Now, it remains an open question, like how, how much Coolidge is responsible for the Great Depression. Histories are deeply divided over the causes of the Depression, even to the present day. Uh, Calvin Coolidge certainly didn't see it coming, but nobody saw it coming. Uh, Calvin Coolidge was blind to the coming catastrophe, and he did nothing to prevent it. Uh, nobody else saw it coming either, but the thing is, he was the president. Everyone else was not the American president. It's supposed to be your job to see this type of stuff coming. But he's a caretaker. He's not an activist. He's not going to secret. He's not going to actively go out and seek problems to solve. That's not his ideology. Now, you should have all of the information required to answer our big question there to the left. You should have an answer to the question, Wilson versus Coolidge. What kind of America do you want? You should be able to evaluate the presidencies of Woodrow Wilson and Calvin Coolidge and judge their respective ideologies, evaluate their successes and failures in the early 20th century. And you should have a really good informed opinion as to who was the better president. And we're going to go beyond Calvin Coolidge in the next lecture. We're going to talk about the Great Depression itself. And I will see you there.